Hi, I'm Loredana Hager, and welcome to my kitchen. As you can see, I am cooking something today. I've started sauteing some garlic on um, the, the temperatures about medium, uh, medium high, because I'm getting ready to cook a filling for a pizza that I'm going to be making today called pizza di scarole, or pizza with escarole. I'm going to be adding several ingredients in a minute, and uh, then I will have this uh, cooking for about 15 minutes or so, and then it has to cool. So after I finish with that, I'm waiting for it to cool down, I will give you a little more information about the specific ingredients that I'm about to add to this garlic, uh, as well as how to make the dough and put it all together. So as you can see, I'm just uh, lightly sauteing the, the garlic. I don't want it to totally brown. So I'm gonna be taking it out in a few seconds because basically this is just to flavor the oil. We don't want to eat this garlic in our pizza today. So I'm gonna take it out. And what I will be adding first, I'm gonna just lower the temperature a little bit. I've got some blanched chopped up escarole. Mm. This has come from our garden. And then to that, I'm gonna be adding some pine nuts. I love pine nuts. I've got some capers. They have been drained and uh, washed because they are in brine, so I really don't want this to be too salty. And then I'm also adding some black olives, and these are specifically Gaeta olives. And I'll tell you a little more later where they also, where they come from and why they're called Gaeta. And then last but not least, we'll add a bit of salt. And then some pepper. And what I like to do is after this is all cooked for about 15, 20 minutes, I like to taste it to make sure that it has enough flavor. And so you can judge for yourself how salty or how peppery you want this. So as you can see, all the flavors are going to combine together. Because the escrow has been blanched, uh, this won't take too long. You do want to make sure that it's well cooked so that it's not tough to eat when you put it in the, uh, uh, on, the, on the dough and uh, cook this later. I wish you could be here to smell this wonderful array mixture of the garlic, uh, the olives, the capers, and of course the escarole, which is really the main ingredient for our recipe today. So I'll, I'll wait on this for a little longer and then we'll let it cool off and I'll share with you uh, the rest of the recipe that we will be making today. Pizza di scarole or pizza con scarole, when translated it means pizza with escarole. And uh, this recipe uh, has been in my family for a while, actually ever since I can remember. Some have said that it originated probably in the 17th century in Italy, and specifically from the region of Campania, that's where I'm from, and even more specifically from the uh, area or province of Naples. This particular dish is prepared usually for uh, during the time of Christmas Eve. It is a very light, a savory appetizer or side dish that really originated with the farmers, the poor people at that time that didn't have a lot of resources in terms of meat or protein to cook. And so they used herbs and greens that grew literally in the fields. Uh, that they could have access to. And that's how it really originated. And of course, it evolved over the centuries. And now it is a well-known dish, as I said, that it's made in Campania. And in my family, I, I've eaten it as a child as far as I can remember. Now, the escarole is a particular uh, green that is in the family of the endive, the endive family. And for this recipe, I've either used in the past the curly endive or frisée, which sometimes in the U.S. it's referred to chicory, along with the broadleaf endive or escarole, which is a little less bitter. So sometimes I, when I can find both, I combine the two together. 
Uh, this particular uh, broadleaf endive is also sometimes known as escarole or as Batavian endive. So if you go to a grocery store and you're fortunate enough to find any of these, uh, look out for the particular type, the, as I said, the curly endive or frise, or the broadleaf or Batavian endive for this recipe. If you're not able to find it uh, often enough, uh, as I've run into that problem, you can also substitute this greens with collard greens. I have done that and it works really well. It is a little milder and less bitter than the broadleaf endive, but it still works very well with this recipe. So feel free to experiment and try either collard greens or the escarole, as I mentioned. The specific ingredients for the filling for the pizza that I sauteed earlier consist of about a pound of freshly picked escarole. I'm fortunate enough to have my husband, who is a great gardener, has a green thumb, and so we grow escarole because we have a hard time finding it in the grocery store. And this is the broad leaf type that I've used. Uh, you could tell from the amount that was in the pan earlier, it really shrinks once you blanch it. That, that particular escarole was rinsed, it was blanched, and then it was chopped up. And so that goes into the pan after you saute a couple of cloves of garlic in about three tablespoons of olive oil. To that, you also add some pine nuts, about three quarter ounces, some olives, and specifically these are Gaeta olives. They are from the region of Gaeta, which is in the region of Lazio, and I added about one ounce. You can use other types of black olives. Stay away from Kalamata olives because they are already bitter and so with the greens it's really not a good combination for this recipe. You also want to add some capers, about a half a tablespoon, and then a pinch of salt and pepper and again you can add it to taste uh, to see how much of that you want to add to the filling. Once you incorporate all of that, uh, I mentioned earlier that you need to have it cool down before you add it to the dough. In the past, my mom has always made the dough similar to what she would use making pizza. Some make the dough that you normally use for bread so that it rises, it has a lot of flour, yeast, and water. What I'm going to be showing you today is a different type of dough that my aunt, my aunt Rosetta, or Zia Rosetta as I've called her, and this is my dad's sister, uh, who worked alongside my grandmother in their restaurant many, many years ago when they lived in Italy. And so she makes the dough, which I, I would call it, uh, it's almost a combination of uh, pâte brisée and uh, kind of a pizza dough because it has the yeast, it has some flour, but it has a lot of olive oil. No butter, but olive oil and water. So it comes out very light. Uh, and very savory and it's a great combination with the filling inside. So here before me I have all the ingredients and I'm going to share with you now the amount. You'll need about a, a half a cup of water, cold water, a half a cup of olive oil, you'll need about two cups of flour, and then you'll need about uh, a quarter teaspoon of yeast, and then about uh, a quarter teaspoon of salt. Now. The amount of flour that I'm using for the amount of escarole will do well in this size pan. If you want to make much more, of course you'll need more escarole. I like to have a good balance of the filling versus the, the thickness of the dough. Uh, so I don't want to have too, too much filling inside, nor do I want the dough on top and bottom. That's what's interesting about this. It's not just a regular pizza, you're going to put dough on top as well. So you don't want to make it too thick and you want to have enough filling. So I'm using this size of pan to make sure that it's well covered. I'm going to be lazy today and I'm going to use an electric mixer, but if you don't have one, this is very easy, very few ingredients to mix and uh, by hand you don't have to knead it very long because as I said, it's not pizza and it's not bread. So let's go ahead and add all of this and I'll show you what it looks like. I've added the dry ingredients, the flour, the yeast and the salt, and all of the water. I'm going to be turning this on low. While you're mixing this, it's also a good idea to turn on your oven and preheat it at 375. So I'm going to let it mix slowly and I'm going to add the olive oil a little bit at a time. You will know that this is well mixed and ready to take out when all of it will separate or pull away from the wall of this bowl. 
as, as you can see, uh, it's starting the hook, uh, the dough hook of the machine is starting to pick up the dough. So I took out the dough out of the bowl, the mixing bowl. I'm just trying to turn it into a ball because I'm going to be um, cutting this in half. I'm going to be rolling out half for the bottom of the pan and then half that will go on top. And in the middle, of course, is the filling. So uh, if you want to be precise, you can weigh it. And I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to weigh it so that I have enough dough both top and bottom. Perfect. So what I want to make sure, uh, especially for the bottom, I'm going to be rolling this out so that it will cover all of it and also have some edges so that I can cover the filling. So what I like to do is take my rolling pin here. Uh, you've also noticed that I've sprayed the pan with some olive oil. There is a lot of oil in here, but you also want to make sure that it doesn't burn or stick. So that's why I've just lightly sprayed it. Okay, so I've rolled this out and it's about, give or take, about an eighth of an inch thick. As I said, I like it fairly thin. And so I'm going to be placing this. It doesn't really have to um, go outside, but it has to have enough on the edge that the filling, and as you can see, I can manipulate it with my hands because of all the oil that's in it. It's not really breaking, so it's very pliable. But I want to have a little bit on edge all around. So I've rolled it out enough. I've placed it on uh, inside of the pan. As you can see, it's kind of pliable. It's very soft, and I've stretched it to the edge to create a little bit of an edge to make sure that the filling, once it's inside, it's not going to ooze out. But of course, the other half will fit on top and will fold it over. If there's too much, we'll be cutting out some of this excess dough. I'm also creating what I call little dimples with my fingers so that when I spread the filling, it will stay in place and flavor the dough. So remember the filling that we cooked earlier, it has cooled down. So you're going to put all of this wonderful mixture and spread it out evenly. And while I've been doing this, I turned on the oven at 375 so that by the time I'm finished putting it together, it will be ready and we will put that in the oven. So I've made this. So now I will take the other half of the dough that we set aside and we'll make the same size, roll it out again, and put it on top. So I've stretched out the top part and I'm getting ready to put it on top. Because of the fact that it is very pliable, I'm going to make sure that all the corners and the edges, and then I'll fold it over, but if I see there's too much dough, I will cut it. Oh, my oven is telling me that it's reached a right temperature, which is just perfect. As you can see, there's quite a bit of dough, a little bit left over, and I'm just going to cut it in a minute. And you can make even little designs and put it on top, and it will bake. It would be wonderful. After I've removed a bit of the excess, I'm just taking the bottom piece, as you can see, and I'm, and I'm kind of wrapping it over, kind of making a little edge around and twisting it and sealing it. Just, I guess, like you would do with the pie when you're making a pie with, with the crust. I'm using this little fork, fork to just further seal it to make sure that as the dough will rise that it doesn't separate and the filling ooze out. So there. Then also in the middle, I'm just going to poke a few 
holes all over. So any kind of steam coming from the ingredients that are inside has a chance to escape. And I thought maybe we'd be a little creative since I have a little bit of dough left over. I might put a little flour in the middle. So I will do that and add it on and I'll show that to you that in a minute. So I had extra dough that I cut off the edges and I decided to make a little design. Uh, you can even bake this on the side separate, but I thought I'd add it to the pizza esque roll. So our oven is ready. It's been preheated at 375. It will go in there for about 30 minutes. Again, it depends on the oven. Uh, it may need to stay a little longer. I will show you at the end what it's supposed to look like, both top and bottom, to make sure that it's thoroughly cooked. I've just taken the pizza out of the oven. It was in there for about 30 minutes. I set it on broil just for a few minutes to brown the top. The bottom is beautifully done. I'll show you in a minute. But this what it looks like. I, me I forgot to mention earlier that in the traditional recipe, anchovies are added and some people also add raisins. In our family, we don't like either. So we've always left out the anchovies and definitely the raisins. But the ingredients that I shared with you today are still wonderful and work very well together. But feel free to add anchovies because as I said, the original traditional recipe calls for that. Also, some people like to serve this hot or lukewarm. Some like to serve it cold. I prefer it warm. So I'm going to be taking it out of the pan and cutting it in pieces and showing you what it looks like on the inside. And of course, it will give me an opportunity to get a first taste. I wanted to show you what it looks like once it's cut and the bottom is beautifully golden color. I like to eat this warm so I couldn't wait. I cut this up and I want to have a taste of this. This is wonderful on its own as an appetizer, as a midday snack, or as I mentioned earlier during Christmas Eve or Christmas holidays, I like to make this all year round because I just enjoy this so much. I'm going to take a bite. Mm. Semplicemente delizioso. The dough is very kind of flaky, it breaks off, and uh, the filling, the, I can taste the olives, and the bitterness, the slight bitterness of the greens, but it just wonderfully mixed with the taste of the dough. I hope you do try this recipe. Let me know how you like it. And again, if you can't find escarole, go ahead and try it with collard greens. It'll taste just as wonderful. Buon appetito.